you have your Bibles, turn with me uh, to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel 3. I know it's a familiar story, uh, but I think you'll understand when I finish why I chose this text uh, in the days in which we are living. Uh, if you got an outline back there, uh, tonight I'm speaking on standing strong. Uh, standing strong. Daniel chapter 3. Got four points tonight, so you're going to have to listen faster than you normally listen. All right, we've got to get one extra one in. And uh, number one, the demand. The demand. Number two, the dilemma. The dilemma. Number three, the decision. Demand, dilemma, and decision. And number four, the deliverance. The deliverance. And, uh, you know, I, I've been saying this all through Revelation, that I think we are living in the last days. Uh, and what got me to thinking about this was about we are one week away from looking at the Antichrist and uh, all that's going to be going on there. And when I, you know, sometimes I just lay in bed and I try to think of, you know, things that I could, you know, I, I do topical things, if you've noticed, on Wednesday night. And uh, I thought of this here. And when I started reading it over again, I was just amazed at the parallel between Daniel 3 and Revelation, uh, as, as we will be uh, seeing that in just a few. I guess it's Revelation 14. So uh, it's exciting. Uh, it, you know, there's some very same uh, parallels with that, and we'll point that out in, here in just a few minutes. Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for a beautiful fall day. Uh, God, thank you for tonight. Uh, Lord, I just lift up all the programs that are going on. I pray for our youth, and I pray for our WANA program, uh, the young marriage class that's going on now. And uh, God, we just ask you to be with us as we uh, study your word and uh, look at, I know it's familiar, but God, I truly believe uh, there will be something there uh, that they can use uh, in the weeks ahead. So God, bless the reading of the scripture. And God, I pray that you would illuminate Scripture and fill us with your Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So let's look at the demand, Daniel chapter 3. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and it's with 60 cubits. Again, I don't have a lot of time to go into uh, back into chapter 1 and chapter 2, but basically Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. His folks could not... Uh, to, you know, uh, interpret the dream. Daniel came up, you know, he, he said basically he's going to kill all the folks, all the people that are supposed to be, be able to interpret dreams, and Daniel interpreted the dream for him in chapter 2. So we go to chapter 3, and it says, whose height was 60 cubics, and it's with 6 cubics. When you look at that, that is 12 by 90 feet. Okay, so it's huge. I mean, it is huge thing. And again, you know, you think about gold. I think it was uh, probably wooden and the gold on the outside. I'm not sure they could find that much gold to be solid gold. Uh, but anyway, it stood out. You could see it a long ways off. And he set it up in the plain of Dura, the province of Babylon. And think about the end times, all right? who's called Babylon. All right, there you go. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word uh, to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, uh, the magistrates, and all the officials of the providence. And again, these are leadership roles. These are government roles here, okay? And it says, to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the providence gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. A dedication. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried, to you it is commanded. All right, this is not an option. It is a command from the king. All right, O peoples, O nations and languages, 
that at that time you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, lyre, uh, the psaltery, the symphony, with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that Nebuchadnezzar has set up. So I'm just telling you, what was he, what was he doing? Remember uh, in Revelation, what is he going to do? He's going to desecrate the temple. He's going to go in, set up his image, and he will be de demanded to worship also. And we know idol worship is breaking the first two commandments. Just quickly look at Exodus 20, Exodus, Exodus 20, verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You, have, you shall have no other gods before me. And we know even in chapter 1, uh, Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't want to eat the king's food. All right? I mean, it was made up of things that weren't good for you. Uh, part of it was liquor, uh, wine, and things. And they asked. They said, hey, can we, uh, for 10 days, not, not follow your menu and your plan? And after 10 days, it was obvious that they, uh, you know, uh, the Hebrew children uh, were, were better. They looked sharper. And, was in, and just you could just see the difference uh, in them. And it says, And you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord God, am a jealous God, visiting of the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. So you see right there, they are breaking the first and second commandment there. We worship no other God. And by the way, as we go through here, I start underlining the word worship. And worship here in this chapter alone is used 11 times. 11 times. And folks, the only God we should worship is capital G, Jehovah God of the Bible. The only one. So let's look back in our text. And, and again, you know, uh, so many, you know, the, the, I, I want to be careful on what I say here. But the government or the people, you know, we, we've made some wrong decisions. Uh, I get upset myself. And, and again, I'm giving you my opinion. When there were uh, the Ten Commandments, like on a courthouse lawn, and they decide, hey, we're going to take that off. Okay, folks. I'm telling you, we need to go back to being a God-fearing, God-respecting nation. And I think, especially early on, when we took uh, reading the Bible out of school, when we took prayers out of the school, we made a huge mistake in that. Because I remember uh, in second and third grade, I think it was third grade, Miss Hawthorne, she would read a Bible passage. She would pray to our class and then we would salute the flag, all right? So anyway, uh, the demand here was, I mean, I mean, basically King Nebuchadnezzar said, you're going to do this, all right? So let's look at the dilemma, the dilemma. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And again, the reason you have uh, fiery furnaces uh, you know, their swords, the way you made things. Uh, you know, you could make shackles. There are just so many things you could have. But they use that as a punishment also uh, for criminals. So at that time, when the, all the people heard the sound of the horn and the flute and the harp and the lyre, in symphony with all kinds of music, all the people, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped. That's the second worship you see here, the golden image which a king Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So what was going on? All right, everybody was doing it. Okay? Did your grandma or your mama ever say this? You want to do something, and then you ended with, everybody's going, everybody's doing that. Well, if everybody jumped off a cliff, would you jump off a cliff? I mean, I, I remember my mom especially saying that. Okay? <clears throat> and folks, we, we have our right to vote, and, and if you don't vote, shame on you. We need to vote in elections, all right? 
But I'm telling you, it doesn't matter what everyone else is doing. We need to do as Christians what God tells us to do. We need to follow God's holy word, not man's. So then we look, and I even thought of, you know, what we call worship. There's all kinds of definitions, but basically worship is giving allegiance to someone. And folks, the only one, I'll say it again, our allegiance is to Jehovah God of this Bible. No one else. Verse 8, therefore at the time, the certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. Again, you know, there's always, you know, the Chaldeans, you know, uh, Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego kind of took some of their places, uh, you know, even, even, even in government. They were going up the ladder. And folks, I'm just telling you, when you deal with the world, you have to understand our values are not our values, and the way they play is not the way we play. All right? We are going to respect people. We're not going to talk about people. We're not going to call people out. I mean, you know, if it's a wrong issue and they're talking about something wrong, you have the right to give your opinion, okay? But so many people, especially in the corporate world, it's just a dog-eat-dog world, and I truly believe these Chaldeans were jealous of the Hebrew children. And they spoke and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. All right? And again, uh, well, I won't say what, 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 let me, let me, uh, they, they were, uh, what do you, I'm trying to think of a good phrase. They were trying to get on his good side, okay? You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, and the psaltery, and the symphony of all kinds of music. And you, you know another thing I thought of yesterday about this? Isn't it amazing how music can set a tone and how important music is? Folks, I'm just telling you. Uh, I, I love our music. I, I love Brother Steve and our praise team. And even when I was up here earlier, he said, you know, the band's back. They're all back. We had the band show. We had, we had everybody. And, and folks, I'm telling you, it prepares your heart for worship. All right? And it says, and shall fall down and worship the goaded image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the providence of Babylon. All right? Two points of emphasis there. They're not one of us. You were the one that put them in charge. All right? Now, again, I don't think they're, you know, a smarting off to the king, but they were just saying this is what happened. And it says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, have not paid a due regard to you, and they do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. And folks, I am telling you, we have, you know, we, we, we have, uh, you know, uh, the, the word of God to guide us. Uh, it doesn't matter what everybody else is doing. It uh, doesn't matter uh, if, you know, if we did this, we would get a promotion. Uh, folks, I, I'm telling you, you know, you need to turn down a promotion if, if if it's for this, if it's for the wrong cause uh, or the wrong way or something undermining or something, uh, you know, it's kind of like, you know, a boss trying to get you to fudge, you know, like if you're an accountant, you know, fix these books, all right? Folks, that is wrong, that is wrong, that is wrong. And I truly believe if you will stand up for what's right, you may get fired, but here's what I think. I think God will give you a better job if you stand for the morals and the Christian values that Christians should stand for. So we see the demand. We see the dilemma. <laughs> and and basic, basically, they're just saying, hey, you either do it or you're going to, to the flame. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.12. 2 Timothy 3.12. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus might suffer persecution. Is that what your Bible says? No, that's not what your Bible says. We'll suffer persecution. Folks, why are we amazed or, or, you know, just, I can't believe they're treating me that way when it's somebody that is just lost, it's somebody that's just caught up in the world. Folks, if you're living for God, especially in this climate, in this day, you are going to suffer persecution. 
And again, I don't even count persecution, you know, somebody talking about me, okay? Because I'll, I'll just be honest with you, folks. I, I've, I've went way past that, all right? I, I can't change someone's opinion about me. And it's not my job to change somebody's opinion about me. My job is to live for Christ. That way, when they are telling something to someone else, they'll say, uh, I don't think Mike Franklin would say that. That's what it means, okay? So if you're living for Christ, you're, you're going you're gonna to bump up against people. You're going to bump up against mean people. You're going to bump up against people with loud opinions. You, they'll call you out sometimes. But folks, just realize they did the same thing to Jesus, okay? It's part of being a Christian and living for Christ. So we see the demand, we see the dilemma, and we see the decision. Hey, did you know, and I know you know this, all life is a decision, okay? And you say, well, what if I decide not to do it? Do something. Well, you just made a decision, okay? So every, all of life, we're going to have to make decisions. And there are people that don't like to make decisions. But folks, I'm just telling you, the closer you get to Christ, the easier decisions become. You say, Mike, why are you saying that? Because if we can get the mind of Christ, if we can get the Word of God into our life, the decision's already been made. See, we made that decision back when we invited Jesus Christ into our life. We made the decision to come under the authority of the Word of God and the authority of God in Jesus Christ. So all we have to ask ourselves is, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? All right? Would he talk back or gossip about somebody? Would he get in an argument and start yelling at somebody? No, he wouldn't. Well, folks, we need to do the same. The dilemma and the decision that Nebuchadnezzar in a rage, notice what the world does, rage and fury, that's anger, could have been throwing things. Uh, you know, there's all, <laughs> I knew a person somewhere in some time, let, let me put it that way, that when he'd get mad, I could literally watch the blood go from his bottom of his neck up to the top of his head. And he had the whitest hair you've ever seen. And you would think a man that age would, would buy, now have some wisdom. But I'm telling you, and when it went up there, you just kind of step back and says, what is he going to say now? Folks, we as Christians need to control our anger, okay? Because there's nothing that frustrates anybody more than you not getting upset. You not, and I've even had people say, are you going to say anything? And you know what I say? Nah, i I'm not going to say anything. And then they say, well, why not? Because you've already made up your mind. This is a one-way conversation, all right? So be calm, be cool in everything that you do. And gave command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, so they brought these men before the king. And the, the kicker here, folks, is he liked these guys, okay? You don't put people in office, you don't have them run things if you don't like them and you don't trust them, okay? And so this is, there, it was, there were two decisions made here. It was by the king, and it was by Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all right? And it says, and Nebuchadnezzar spoke and said to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve uh, my God or worship the golden image, which I have set up? Now, if you are ready at the time, you hear the, the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, lyre, the psalter, the symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made good. But if you do not, and what's so funny about that, I'm just telling you, the king was wasting his time. They, they heard him the first time. Okay, my mind, you know, you threaten, you know, it's like I say all the time, you're going to threaten me with heaven? And you think about it, think about it, thrown it into fire, you think, that's horrible. Well, if it's seven times hotter and it killed the guys on the outside, I'm telling you, you ain't going to last three seconds in there, all right? So, you know, you can look at it and say, man, I don't want to die burning. Well, folks, I'm telling you, if it was for the cause of Christ, that's exactly what I would do. Okay, I don't know about you. Man, he died for you. And his was worth, 
I really believe Jesus had it worse than that. And do you know why? Because he suffered on a cross. That is a slow, painful death. And you literally uh, suffocate yourself. So if Jesus would do that for us, man, I'm telling you, I have no problem dying for Christ. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of the burning furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, and you know what, folks? God gives us words to say. God gives us wisdom. Okay? You, these guys are smart. Okay? These guys were sharp. These guys were in tune with God. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. And basically they're saying, hey, we can, we can give you the answer right now. All right? We don't, we don't have to think about it. All right? If this is the case, our God whom we will serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. And folks, they wouldn't popping off to the king. You know what they were showing? They were showing faith and trust in God. Folks, our God can do anything. And I think sometimes when we read a story about like that, oh, he hadn't done nothing, nothing like this lately. Oh, you, ha you haven't been in third world countries. You haven't been where people have been miraculously healed. Get on the internet and follow a real missionary around. I guarantee you they're doing things that are not being done. Phil, would you agree with that? They're doing things that, that are not being done here. Okay, why? Because they already made the decision. If I have to die for the cause of Christ, so be it. Okay? And it says, He will deliver us from your hand, O King, but if not, Man, I love that phrase right there. That always sticks out in my mind. But if not, if for some reason, and, and, and what are they talking about? If it's the will of God, then it's the will of God. All right? You know what we spend most of our latter years trying not to do? Die. <laughs> Think about it. You know, we're popping pills. We're going to seminars. We're drinking shakes. We're doing all. And you should be healthy. I'm not saying you shouldn't be healthy, but we shouldn't be afraid to die either. That's what they're saying. But if not, if we, gotta die, if we have to die, so be it. All right? And I love the answer. Let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the golden image which you have set up. Notice the line. You, folks, I know I say it all the time. Every word in the word of God is, is important. They were saying, you made this rule, you set it up, but it's not going to affect us. Live or die, it doesn't matter to us. Uh, First Peter, it's not on your sheet there. I found this uh, this morning when I was doing some last-minute preparation. First Peter 4, you might want to write it down, 12 through 14. Beloved. Do not think it strange concerning the fiery trials which will try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you, are per you partake in Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceedingly joy. There's two things there, two words that I want you to pay attention to. Number one, but rejoice. Rejoice. Folks, I know it's hard to do, but we need to rejoice in all situations of life. And if for some reason, you know, we were here and it was at the end of the service and Jonathan's trying to get a hold of Lori and says, uh, you might want to come home, your house is on fire. Hey, I mean, I'm not going to be out there just laughing about it, but I'll be switched, folks. Everything now, I understand pictures and personal things. We've never had a fire. I've never, and I know it's hard. I'm not, I'm not trying to say that's no big deal. I'm simply saying, hey, nobody was in there. We can replace most of the stuff. All right. We need to understand there's a reason and a purpose for everything. We're going to trust God no matter what happens. And notice the second thing, I don't rejoice, but you may also be glad with exceeding joy. You know what some people, when, when, when some people are ugly to other peoples 
and then that person walks away mad. In a conversation, I, I've heard this several times. Why did, why did you let him walk all over you? Why weren't you mad? Why didn't you give him a piece of your mind? Well, I can answer that one. I don't have that much mind. I don't need to give any of mine away, all right? But folks, that's what makes a difference, okay? Here's how the world would act, but I'm not going to act that way, okay? I'm going to just be happy that I'm alive, be happy that God loves me, be happy that, hey, I got, I'm not sure what insurance I got. State Farm. I've got State Farm insurance, all right? I'm not sweating that. All right? And it says, no, I didn't do a commercial. I, I'm pretty sure that's what I got. Verse 14, if you're reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. You know what God's saying up there? Good job, Mike. Good job. You did a good job. I, Jesus, had to suffer. And folks, if we're going to follow Jesus, that's what Peter's saying. If you're going to follow him, there's some suffering involved. And folks, if you just signed up, you know, I've heard that too. Well, I didn't sign up for this. Well, folks, when you signed up for Jesus, you signed up to follow him. Hey, we sing the song, no turning back, no turning back. All right? So he's saying it's going to happen. But if you're reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed. But on your part, he is glorified. Folks, I don't know about you, but that's why we live. That's why we do what we do. That's why we preach. So God may be glorified. So Jesus may, may be magnified. And we need to learn this in our lives. I, I think it's a hard lesson to learn. We say it, but sometimes we don't do it, folks. It's not about me. It's not about me. It's about God. So we see the demand. We see the dilemma. We see the decision. Don't matter. Don't matter. King, do what you want. We're not going to bow down. We're not going to worship you or your statue. And let's see the deliverance. And folks, if you can't get fired up about this section, I'm just telling you, folks, you, you, <laughs> maybe you need to rededicate your life to Christ or just something. All right? Because when I read this section, and I've read it, I've preached it, I, I taught it in Sunday school, it still fires me up fires me up every time, all right? Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and the expression on his face changed toward Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And that's why the Bible tells you do not hang around angry men, okay? Because pretty soon, they're going to spew their anger on you. I mean, you might be their friend today, but I'm telling you, if they're angry and have temper issues, you need to get away from people like that. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace up seven times more than it usually was heated, and he commanded certain men, mighty men of valor. And you know what? That is so unfair. A soldier that, that is, has allegiance to this king, basically, he didn't care about the soldiers. He wanted his way. He wanted to make sure these guys were going to be, I call it, double-digit dead. All right? No chance of them surviving this. All right? And he's commanded certain men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, in their trousers, in their turbans. Why did they leave the clothes on? Because that fuels the fire. All right, remember the, the days, uh, you know, some of the Caesars and some of the, the pagan uh, kings would, would literally wrap Christians in cloth, pour oil on them, and make torches out of them, all right? And it says, then these men were bound in their coats and their trousers and other garments and were cast into the midst of the burning furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent, notice the word, and the furnace was exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Now, how cool is this? What, what was the only thing that burned? The rope that had them bound. Think about that. How else did they get up? How else would they be walking around? All right? The only thing 
that was affected. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. I love that word. He, his mouth dropped. He thought he was so mad he was having a stroke and seeing things. He knew what he said. He knew the command that was given. He knew there is no way these guys are going to survive that. But it says King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. And when he rose in haste and spoke to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? And they answered and said to the king, True, O king, look. Notice the exclamation mark. I see four loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Well, folks, I know there are a lot of, you know, new age people. Three, no, one, two, and three equals four to some people. Or one, one, and one equals five to some people. But when King goes, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who's that fourth dude? Well, folks, I believe it's, it's that when, when those rare times in the Bible where Jesus himself comes down and, and protects them, and walks with them in the midst of their trials and tribulation. Then verse 26, Then Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning, fiery furnace and spoke, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God. Now think about this, folks. How would he know to say that? Do you not think Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and have been to go through the, you know, being part of his government and being a part of all that was witnessing to him. How else would he know that? Somebody had to witness to them. And folks, I believe it was the Hebrew children. Servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came in the midst of the fire. And the satraps, administrators, governors, the king's counselors gathered together and they saw these men whose bodies the fire had no power. Folks, I'm telling you, it made a believer out of that king. You know the cool thing about that? How much influence would a king have on the people of that day and of that age? I'm, I'm talking a huge impact. Really, it went from a pagan governing thing you know, uh, thing to, to, to him making a statement like that. And it says, the hair of their head was not cinched, nor were their garments affected, and the smell of fire was not on them. <laughs> Folks, only God can do that. That is a miracle. A miracle. And folks, I still believe in miracles. I still believe Sometimes it's health. Sometimes uh, it can be, you know, uh, other, other things, that pray, something that we were praying for. I know one lady in Lawton prayed 39 years for her husband, husband to be uh, saved. And on his deathbed, he came to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. It was a miracle. He was an alcoholic. He was a drunk. And I'm telling you, she was our cook when I went to youth camp and I was teaching on the dangers of alcohol to our kids and she never had done this before. But she said, Brother Mike, can I share something with you? And we're talking about, I'd say at that time she was in her 70s, still cooking at youth camp. And I said, Miss Isabel, her name was uh, Anne Isabel. I said, Miss Isabel, Sure, you can have the floor. And she told her testimony about her husband and, and the dangers of alcohol. And I'm telling you, it was better than any lesson I ever taught on alcohol because she lived it. She lived it. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and who sent his angel. Notice the capital angel, deity, deity, up earlier, like the Son of God, capital S, capital G, and delivered his servants who trusted him 
and they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve or worship any god. Notice the little g, except their own god. I mean, he made a decree. He said, I'm just telling you, I've changed my mind. That is awesome. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego shall be cut into pieces. All right? So you pick which one you want to do. All right? Would you rather be burned in an instant or cut into pieces? He made it worse. To me, this is worse than being thrown into a fiery furnace because I'm just telling you the smoke inhalation alone, you, you in the heat alone, I mean, you, it's, I'm just telling you, it's going to be quick. And it says, and their houses shall be made ash heap, burn their houses down, because there is no other God who can deliver like this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. And I close with this. Joshua 24. Joshua 24. Verse 14. Now therefore... Fear the Lord. Oh, folks, we need to respect God. We need to respect God's commandments. We need to respect God's law. Uh, we need to respect the Word of God. We need to respect others around us. If there is a word that we have lost, I'm telling you, it's respect for others. All right? Remember the day when you just about everyone, you know, men would be at a door, and they go in, and they'd open the door for a woman. Remember the day when kids would say, yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am, and yes, sir, and no, sir? Remember when you could go out? I remember staying at my grandparents. They lived outside of Bingo, Oklahoma. And uh, I'm just telling you, my grandpa left the keys in the ignition. We never locked our doors. We had a, anybody, I'm showing my age here, a sleeping porch. Had the little latch on it. Most of the time, we wouldn't even put the latch down. Why? Because we, we, we didn't live in fear. And folks, I am telling you, we have a chance in our lives to make a difference. We have a testimony to say, you say this. And folks, is that not what Jesus did? Did not Jesus spend his whole life saying, hey, you say this, but here's what I say. And the only difference is, you say this, but here's what God says, okay? We have a chance in our society to, to make a difference. And we need to stand up against ungodly things, okay? And I understand God has used government, I mean government people, to chastise his own people. You look at Pharaoh, okay? Why? Because they, they were not doing what was right. But it's our job to let people know, thus saith the Lord. Fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth. Put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. And I go back to what I said earlier. Everyone has a choice. Doesn't matter what everybody else is doing. Doesn't matter the consequences of, of what might happen. All right? And I did. I, I've heard a stat. Matter of fact, I was corrected by somebody uh, in the church uh, about the stat. I said 70% of, of what you worry about doesn't happen. They said they saw it recently, and it was 82% of the things we worry about never happen. And I'll be switched, folks, if I'm going to lay in bed at night and lose sleep over what somebody else thinks of me. I, I, I mean, I know this doesn't sound right, but I don't care what somebody else thinks of me. I care about what God knows about me. And what I've learned in 43 years of ministry, my job is to please the Lord. I want to please y'all, but I'm just telling you, I, I refuse to worry about things that are totally out of my, I mean, 
I, I'm just not going to do it. And it says, whether the gods of the, your father served that were on the other side of the river, the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell. And we know this, man, everybody probably has this somewhere in their home, but it's for me and my house. We will serve the Lord. Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you that we serve a God that's still in the miracle business. God, you can still part the sea. You can still heal people and even bring them back to life. So God, I pray that uh, when, when we're challenged, when the lost people are trying to put us into their box or into their, their area, God, I pray that we would just reject that. I, I pray that we would do it you know, a gently. I pray we wouldn't be rude or mean or uh, just, just in an attack mode. God, I'd pray that we'd simply say, you know, uh, why? Why aren't you mad? Well, folks, I'm a Christian, and I, I know with all my heart God does not want me to be mad about things. I'm at peace with God, and I'm at peace with others. And God, I pray that that's so in our lives. And God, I know I've said it a thousand times since I came here. Every night I pray we ask ourselves, am I right with God? Am I right with my fellow man? Am I right with my family? And God, I pray that if we can't answer yes, 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 that we will not go to sleep without doing business with you. God, thank you for this Old Testament example. Man, I've, I've heard this since sunbeams, since vi vacation Bible school. But God, it's, it's a reminder that we live in a wicked world and we need to stand for God, no matter what it costs us. And God, thank you for that reminder in Jesus' name. Amen.